Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Nicolas Quesada. I am a recent hire here at Polytechnique, where I lead a group in quantum information and photonics. And I am incredibly happy to welcome today's speaker, Guillaume Tecadat. Guillaume completed his PhD, his undergrad at the University of Toronto. Then he moved to Ottawa, where he worked with Jeff Lundin for his master's degree. And then he crossed the ocean to work with Ian Wamsley back when he was at Oxford and where he completed his PhD doing really beautiful experiments with parametric sources and photon number of solving detectors. And he's now back in Canada, where he is now a postdoc at the National Research Council in Ottawa. So, Guillaume, la parole est toi. Merci. Et merci pour l'invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be presenting some uh, work which has been ongoing for a few years now. I started working on this at uh, Imperial College in London. Yeah, so I started this work a few years ago at uh, Imperial and continued working on, oh, it's wonderful, this uh, in, uh, in Ottawa. Um, so this work is about measuring the modal structure uh, of light using this technique called intensity interferometry, which I'll, I'll be talking more about. So by the mode structure of light, I'm, I'm just referring to the shape uh, that a light beam can have in its different degrees of freedom. And uh, this shape in general is described by a distribution in both in amplitude and in phase. Um, so in general, this uh, you know, beam shape can display quite a rich structure, especially when there are correlations between different degrees of freedom. So for instance, you can have these uh, vector beams where there are correlations between the space and the polarization degrees of freedom uh, of the light. And so characterizing this structure, uh, there's two main uh, requirements. So the first is obvious. We're dealing with uh, optical frequencies, uh, which are much faster than our detector time resolutions. So if we want to measure that phase structure, we need to use some sort of interferometric measurement. Uh, the second feature, which is more unique to, to quantum light, is that uh, we're sometimes dealing with light sources that have entanglement. And this can arise very naturally. So for instance, in these spontaneous parametric down conversion sources, where one pump photon is split into two lower energy uh, signal in either photon, because that process has to sat satisfy energy conservation, uh, there could be strong frequency correlations between the down converted photons. So each photon doesn't live in its own spectral mode. It lives in this joint mode, which describes something about both photons simultaneously. And so to, to characterize that structure, you generally do some sort of joint measurement on both photons. So why is this um, important? Well, this sort of generic picture I'm, I'm showing here at the top, whenever you want to do quantum enhanced sensing, so to use light to, to learn something about a sample, in general, that sample when print information, both the amplitude and the phase. So you need to do a full mode characterization to get the information out. Um, so this is useful for things like quantum enhanced imaging, spectroscopy, and so on. The other point, which is uh, less obvious, and I think also very important, is the need for high modal purity on light sources. And to, to develop these high modal purity sources, we need good ways to characterize the mode structure. Why are these sorts of sources important? Well, nowadays there is a push to try to increase the scale of photonic quantum technologies. So to build things like photonic uh, like communication networks between cities, say, and even maybe photonic quantum computers. And when you try to build these systems, these experiments require you to interfere light that's generated by independent sources, independent quantum light sources. And if you try to interfere a light that's generated from independent sources, you need to worry about the mode in which that photon is generated. And in particular, you want photons generated from different sources to be generated in the same mode, right? This is obvious so that they can interfere. So the mode purity will be, uh, will, will, will tell you the sort of interference visibility that you can have between different, uh, different sources. So this sort of thing, uh, is very important when you're designing experiments like the one in Genwick Pan's group or the chip that uh, Xanadu is building. They worry a lot about this mode structure uh, of their quantum light sources. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to be presenting uh, 
two, two things. The, the first part will be using this technique of intensity interferometry to measure the spatial mode structure, and we'll focus on uh, single photons. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, using the same technique, a measurement of uh, the spectral mode of photon pairs. Okay, so the first uh, part of the talk was done in the group of uh, this work done in the group of Ben Sussman at the NRC. And uh, the second part was done in Ian Walton's group in London. So um, I'll start off uh, by saying a little bit about holography, uh, because uh, holography is essentially underpinning uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about. So holography was invented by Gabor in the late 40s. Uh, it's, it's a technique to uh, record and reconstruct a wave pattern. Um, so originally, yeah. Oh, you're just seeing <laughs> <seeing it. laughs> um, yeah, it's better than before. Mm. So uh, originally, Gabor was interested in using uh, this technique to achieve so-called lensless imaging. And so um, in electron microscopes, the resolution was limited by the quality of the lenses. This was a way to get around that. Uh, but then about 10 years after Gabor developed this technique, uh, the laser was invented, and then optical holography like, really took off. Um, and then you know, this became even more true uh, when the digital camera was uh, about a few decades later. So in holography, there's, there's two uh, steps. The, the first step, you record the hologram, and this is done eventually by taking a single light source and splitting it into two paths. You use one path to illuminate the object, and the other path serves as a reference. And you interfere the light scattered from the object with the reference. The interference pattern is the hologram. Okay. So you can record this with a photographic plate or obviously a camera. Uh, and you can then reconstruct the object uh, by shining that same reference beam onto the interference pattern. And the diffracted light will look like uh, the, the, the object. So this has a lot of applications, um, far beyond what I guess Gabor would have envisaged. Um, and uh, the, the main reason is that it's a phase sensitive imaging technique. So it gives you access to phase information and phase can carry a lot of uh, useful information about a sample. In particular in biology, if you can use this phase information to learn about the refractive index change in your sample or about the depth of, of your sample. So here's a picture of some cells, uh, oops, some cells, and you can see that the color map here is telling us about the thickness of these cells. Uh, and you don't have to use this technique with uh, small things. You can also look at larger objects. So the statue on the right, uh, you can see some contour lines, and these are actually interference fringes showing you the depth of this statue. So, um, one of the requirements uh, for holography, of course, is an interferometric technique, so you need phase stability. Um, so you, this phase offset phi naught here has to be stable during your hologram exposure time. So that means that if this mirror here is vibrating a little bit, uh, that causes this quantity to fluctuate and will wash away interference fringes and, and, and ruin your, your hologram. Uh, right. So. The question I want to ask and, and answer in this talk is, uh, well, can we generate holograms if there's this sort of phase noise? And you know, related to this is actually, can we generate holograms of objects which themselves emit light? So instead of thinking about using a single light source and splitting it into two like in this arrangement, what if the object itself emits light and we want to interfere that light with an external reference and look for interference? And actually, these two questions are related because we know that if we try to interfere light generated by independent sources, they're only going to have phase correlations over a very short time scale, usually given uh, related to the inverse of their spectral bandwidth. Okay, so I'll start with the first question because there's there's actually an easy way to to generate holograms when you have phase noise, and and that's just to speed up your your exposure time. So uh, let's imagine that we have this, these phase fluctuations. So say this mirror is vibrating. Um, and right, I should say that, so in this little toy mo uh, model here, our object is this phase mass, so this maple leaf. 
the grayscale pattern is just telling us about the phase value. Um, so yeah, in, in each frame, we're going to say that we can consider this phi here to be constant because our exposure time is, is short enough. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, in a sort of typical experiment, this is what you would see. So this is with 100,000 photons in each frame. You can clearly see the, the maple leaf. And what we see between each frame is that different features of the maple leaf are, are showing up. And, and this is because of this randomly changing phase by not. Okay? But it's not so much an issue because we can imagine combining all of these frames in order to retrieve out the original phase map. But okay, let's imagine that we can't just blast our, our sample with a lot of light, say because it's fragile, it's like some biological sample, or maybe it's really far away, so we're limited to how much light we can collect in each frame. So then we're more in the regime on the right, where there's like 100 photons. And then it's you know harder to see the, the, the maple leaf, right? If you look carefully, you can still see some features, and so you maybe if you take a sufficient number of these frames, you can uh, recover the phase mass. Uh, but well, now let's, if you continue this argument, you end up in this sort of ultimate limit, which is, can you do holography with, with two photons? Right? So one photon coming from the object and another from the lens. Yeah. So just to be clear, what you're showing on the left is an interference pattern observed with a interference with this uh, reference beam where the phase is, is randomly there. That's right. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yes. But thanks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, can, you know, what, what happens in this regime where now there's only two photons in each frame, one photon from the object and one from the reference. And, and this is a quantum optical question, right? We're dealing now with single photons. So uh, the, the, the setup that I'm considering is, is shown here in the top left. We'll have, uh, we have now the single and reference photon combined on a beam splitter where the, the interference happens. And we're going to look at both output ports of the beam splitter with a single photon camera. Um, just for simplicity, we'll imagine this is a one dimensional problem. So X and X prime here are labeling the, the relative position of the photons in, in either output port of that beam splitter. Okay, and so it's this phase difference between the signal and the reference, uh, which we want to determine. So if we have true single photons, if these are really single photons coming from the reference and signal, it's no longer sufficient to just measure single pixels on your camera, right? So if you imagine that you only measured one uh, one photon, so you only one pixel fired, it means that you lost one of the photons before that beam splitter, and so there couldn't have been any interference, right? You lost one of the photons. So if, to sort of erase the switch way information, you really need to look at uh, pairs of pixels firing. So this means not looking at intensity, but now you need to measure intensity correlations between pixel pairs. This is to see interference. So this sort of thing uh, was uh, done exactly in this, in this paper here back in 2016. So they measured the hologram of a single photon using exactly, exactly this intensity correlation. Uh, so here's a, a plot, a theory plot of what their joint probability of measuring a photon at X prime and X is. Uh, and in, in this example, they had this quadratic phase difference between the signal and the reference. Okay. And so this is essentially spatially resolved combo mandal interference. So let me explain that a little bit. So along the, the diagonal here, along the white line, where x is equal to, to x prime, this means that the, the, the rays, so the, the two photons incident on the beam splitter came from the same, same angle, so that they're indistinguishable from one another. If you have two identical photons getting a beam splitter, the Hong Mandel interference tells us that they'll always leave that beam splitter from the same port. So we should never measure coincidence with the output. But if X is not equal to X prime, uh, then you can show that the probability of measuring this coincidence depends on the relative phase difference between, between the photons in, in this way here. So by this expression here, and this is sort of the power of this technique, because it depends on this relative phase difference, it means that if you have any phase noise in either the reference or the signal, it just cancels out, so long as that phase noise is spatially independent. Uh, so this is really useful because it means that in this experiment, they could integrate their hologram over hours and not have to phase stabilize their step. 
Uh, and so the question that, that I want to ask is, is this a, is this a quantum effect? Um, and the, of course, Hongo Mandel interference is a quantum effect, but there's a more general interference effect that underlies what's going on here. And uh, that interference effect was first uh, used uh, by, by Henry Brown and Twist, in fact, all the way back in the early days of quantum optics. So they built this telescope that had a very large baseline and they collected light from the star. And they showed that even though the, the light collected from both arms of this interferometer is very far apart, uh, they still saw this, this correlation function, uh, I mean, tell them something about the size of, of that star, right? And so this is in some sense showing that you can observe interference between photons, even though they don't share any phase correlations. And uh, this, is, this is not a quantum effect, right? The photons you are generating from, from the star. So about 10 years later, there's this really nice experiment from Mandel and his co-workers, uh, which like, showed that this is not limited to the fact that the photons came from the same source. So what they did is they took two lasers, you combine both beams on a beam splitter and then looked at intensity correlations at the output of that beam splitter. And they showed that you see uh, interference there as well, even though these lasers do not share any phase correlations. Right? And so you can think of this, if you'd like, as a uh, Hongu Mandel interference between phased average coherent states. Uh, but in this sort of thing predates Hongu Mandel interference. Okay? Um, so what do we need to, to see this sort of interference? So there's two, two things. Uh, the first is that the photons have to be identical in all the unmeasured degrees of freedom. So in the Mandel experiment, for instance, those lasers needed to have the same spectrum. Right? So you didn't, because otherwise this will tell you something about where the photons came from for the research. And the other thing, which is important, is that your detectors need to be fast enough to measure these intensity correlations within the coherence time of the, of the light sources. So usually this has been done using single pixel detectors, uh, things like photomultiplier tubes or avalanche photodiodes and, and fast coincidence circuits. Uh, but nowadays we have access to these really nice single photon cameras, which let us measure these intensity correlations now in a, in a spatially resolved manner. And this has caused a lot of excitement in quantum imaging uh, because now we can use these sort of cameras to, to do and to measure these correlations in a, in a spatially resolved manner. And so here's just a subset of the many papers that have used this idea uh, to, so using intensity interferometry. But they mostly uh, all use these sort of pair sources, so photon pair sources, and did essentially like something similar to what was done in that earlier paper where they're doing spatially resolved on the mantle. <laughs> But you know, there's nothing limiting limiting us to doing this with quantum light. Uh, we can use this technique to, to observe interference between classical or even combinations of classical and quantum light. And I think a really nice example of that is this uh, paper from John Lee Pan's group, where they showed that you can interfere uh, photons collected from the sun with photons generated uh, from a quantum dot. Now, of course, to see interference, you need to very strongly spectrally filter. The, the sunlight photons. Um, they did that using an etalon and, and also spatially filtered them using signal of fibers. But this like shows that as long as you can you know, erase information about where the photons came from on when they hit that beam splitter, you'll see interference and it doesn't matter that they are phase correlated or, or not. So let, can we use this sort of thing for, for holography? Uh, and so the goal will be to you know, we're combining this signal, which is potentially coming from far away, that has some phase on it, combine it with a reference on a beam splitter, and then measure both output ports of the beam splitter with a single photon camera, say, and then look for correlations between intensities measured at two different pixels. And then we, we will have to filter the, the, the beams so that they're uh, identical in polarization and, and frequency. Again, you can. Uh, show that the what you will measure if you do this, so that the histogram of the, these correlations is given by this expression here. So there's this interference pattern that depends on the phase difference 
uh, in that way. And, and the visibility of this interference will depend on the mode overlap between the signal and the reference and the, the photon statistics. And so if we have uh, true single photon sources in both the signal and reference mode, then we can get up to uh, unit visibility, which is what Hongo Mandel interference is. If we have coherent states, then we're limited to, to 50%. But the, the visibility is not so important because we can use some holographic techniques to retrieve this phase. You know, and it's pretty robust to even small visibilities, as, as I'll show. <clears throat> and just to reiterate, the main benefits of doing this is that the photons can be generated in principle from independent sources. And, and you don't need phase stability. Okay, so this is useful because it means that uh, you can do holography of things that are very far away. So we wanted to demonstrate this. Um, and so we've measured the spatial mode uh, of a single photon using uh, a laser beam. So light that has very different photon statistics and that came from different uh, sources. So here was our, our experiment, a schematic of it. Um, there are like two single mode fibers at the bottom coming out of the, the left one is our reference. So this was simply an attenuated laser. In this experiment, we used a pulsed uh, titanium sapphire laser. We just attenuated, and that's our reference. Coming out of the right fiber is our signal, and it was it's a heralded single photon. So this is generated from a source like the one shown at the bottom. Uh, this, of course, we had to, to filter the photon using a bandpass filter to ensure that its spectrum is overlapped with that of the, uh, the reference. And we also have to make sure that the pulses arrived at the beams that are on the same at the same time. The photon, the signal went through a spatial light modulator and we used this to encode some phase mass, this is some phase phi, and this is the quantity that we're gonna try to determine. Um, and then we image the output of the beam splitter with this single photon camera. So this is a uh, intensified CMOS camera. Uh, the unique feature of it is that it's a time tagging camera. So in addition to telling you which pixel fired, it tells you when that pixel fired as well. Uh, and it does so eight nanoseconds time resolution, which was sufficient for us to observe these uh, intensity correlations. So we could say, okay, these two pixels fired within some time window, therefore they came from the same, the same pulse. Okay. So here are some results. Um, this is for a one-dimensional phase pattern. Uh, the phase pattern has this quadratic term, uh, which we used, uh, we imparted using the, using the SLM. And then there's this linear term, k naught x, which we imparted actually by tilting the beams on the beam splitters, so purposefully misaligning them. And the reason why we did this, which will be clear in a second. So if we, if we just measure single pixel events and do sum over a long time, what we see is this sort of regular intensity image, which is shown there. There's no sign of uh, interference. Uh, but if we instead look at correlations um, between detecting a pixel at a particular X position at one beam with detecting a, 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 detecting a photon at a particular pixel at one beam, detecting a photon at an, another pixel in the other beam, we see this, this interference pattern show up. Uh, here, the color map is uh, telling you the number of correlation events in, uh, I think, a few hours. So that our integration time is a few hours. And so there's this like regular fringe period along the antidiagonal. That's given by this k naught of x. And so the reason that we applied this shear is to, to use a, a well-known technique in holography called off-axis holography, where if you take a Fourier transform and that interferogram, what you see are three uh, three blobs, the sideband blobs, so the ones that are separated from the middle by k naught, are the sort of the good stuff. So this is the, the term that has the phase sensitive information, and we can filter it uh, away from the rest just by applying a window function Fourier space and then taking the inverse Fourier transform. And then doing this, we recover the phase uh, that we applied to, to the single photon on the, with spatial light modulators so that crosses the theta and the, the line theta, the orange line. So this is for a, a one-dimensional case. Um, we can do the same thing with the two-dimensional case, but now retrieving the phase is a little bit trickier 
because what we're measuring is this four dimensional correlation function, right? So we're measuring the XY position of the photon in the right beam and the XY position of the photon in the left beam, which is this four dimensional quantity. And it's hard to do 4D filtering with 4D matrices. I tried, it's difficult to picture things. Um, so we came up with another way to retrieve the base. Um, uh, let's just to remind you the expression of uh, the, the correlation matrix is given by this. And so one thing we can do is like fix a pixel in the right beam uh, here labeled by R0 and say a condition on having detected a photon at this pixel in the right beam, what does the left beam intensity image look like? And what it looks like is an interference pattern given by this with the phase mask, which is what we're after, with an offset given by the phase mask value at that pixel that we chose as the reference. So in practice, this is what this, this process looks like. So here the phase mask is, we go back to the, the maple leaf again. Um, that's, that's the phase mask. And the red arrows are showing the regions where I've made this uh, selection for the, for the right beam pixel, the R2 selection. So depending on which region I pick, I see a different interference pattern in the left beam. And so you can imagine kind of combining all of these frames uh, to then retrieve the, the, the phase mask you know, up, up to some global, uh, global phase. Um, and the nice thing about this technique is that, that you don't need to scan any phase. It's completely uh, self-referencing. Okay, so, so this uh, kind of brings me to the end of the first part of the talk where I showed that we can use this intensity interferometry to do holography in a way which is uh, resilient to, to phase uh, fluctuations in your beams. Um, and I think that this is uh, quite uh, interesting for doing things like holography of uh, remote objects. And so actually we're doing an experiment on that moment uh, using something like shown at the bottom here where your object can be hundreds of meters away um, and you can still generate, see something about the phase of that object. Um, and you know, perhaps even more excitingly is doing holography with, with light generated from a, an object with its itself generates light. So maybe, for instance, using this to characterize the spatial mode of a quantum thought. Okay, um, so this brings me now to the second part of the talk where essentially we're gonna do the, the same thing, uh, but, but now with frequency. So uh, whereas before we were doing spatially resolved intensity correlation measurements, now we're going to do uh, frequency resolved intensity correlation measurements. And we're gonna do this to try to learn about the spectral mode of, of a single photon, or as I'll show you, you can also do this for photon pairs. And the, the nice thing about this idea uh, is that when you're trying to measure the spectral mode uh, of, of light, so of the pulse shape, um, if you want to learn about the spectral phase, you usually need to use um, some sort of strong nonlinearity to, to, to learn that phase if you want to do that in a self reference manner. Because we have this reference, we don't need to use these nonlinearities, right? So the nice thing that we can do is start with this strong laser pulse, which will be our reference. And because it's strong, uh, we can characterize its, its spectral shape with a conventional uh, technique like spider or frog, where you can buy these devices commercially. Uh, and then learn about the spectral phase of that reference. And then we can just attenuate it down to the single photon level and combine it with our signal, which could be a single photon. Uh, and then use this technique to, to learn its spectral phase. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this is for a, a single photon and I wanna say a little bit more about photon pair sources. Uh, so as I mentioned at the start of the talk, uh, these are uh, sort of like a workhorse in quantum optics. Uh, we pump these nonlinear materials uh, with strong pulses and strong pumpings. Um, and the outcomes like uh, these pairs of photons typically labeled uh, signal and either. And they live in this joint spectral mode uh, labeled here by psi. And this function psi is it's a complex value function has an amplitude and phase. And in particular, it's, it's generally not going to be separable in terms of omega s and omega i because of the frequency correlations uh, that, that can arise in this process. But I wanna say a little bit more about 
that. Uh, so what actually determines this um, this quantity, this joint spectral mode? Well, it's two things. It's given by the product of the, the phase matching function of the nonlinear process and the, the pump bandwidth, uh, the pump spectral mode. Sorry. So the phase matching function that's determined by the your nonlinear material. So it's like dispersion properties, the length of your crystal, and things like that. Uh, and then the, the pump bandwidth, well, obviously that, that's, that's given by the, the, the pump shape. And then you can think of two different like regimes. Uh, one where you're using a, a pulsed laser. So you have this you know, broad spectrum. And in this case, you can get a joint spectral mode that looks something like this because you have some uncertainty in which pump frequency component generated the, the photon pairs, right? So it's, it's, you get something which is fairly round. There's these sink side lobes, uh, which are due to the fact that you have this non nonlinearity non with sharp uh, cutoffs. Uh, but besides those, this looks fairly uncorrelated. Uh, whereas if you use a continuous wave laser that has a very narrow spectrum, um, you get these strong correlations between what the signal and hybrid frequencies could be. And why do we care? Well, this becomes crucial uh, when you're interfering light generated from different sources. Um, so in, in the sort of simplest uh, multi-photon experiment, you have two photon pair sources and you're, you're using each source to herald a single photon. And then we're gonna combine the heralded single photons in a beam splitter and look for uh, Hong Mandel interference. Okay. Um, so, as what we expect is as we scan the delay between these input photons, we see a, a dip in the, the number of coincidences. Now, in this uh, example here, in both scenario one and scenario two, the marginal spectrum of these uh, interfering photons is completely identical. And yet, in scenario one, the dip visibility is far uh, worse than in scenario two. And this is due to some uh, which way information, which we're sort of ignoring when we have these strong frequency correlations, right? Do you imagine that instead of just having a click detector here, you have some frequency resolving detector, then measuring the color of the photon here would tell you about the color of the photon here. So that could potentially be different than the color of the photon here. And so this would, which way information means that there's a reduction in, in the interference visibility. So another way to think about it is that there's some entanglement here and we're sort of tracing over this, uh, this one of the degrees of freedom. And so we are left with this mixture of spectral modes in the, in the signal modes. And this is not the case when you have this round J, JSA where yeah, even if you had a frequency resolving detector in the idler path, that tells you nothing about the, the color of the photon in the signal path because there are no correlations. Again, you can ask, or it can be like filter, you just put bandpass filters to try and improve this. You can uh, up to a certain degree. And of course, it, it, filtering introduces losses, which is problematic. And um, Filtering is also uh, becomes problematic in, in the high gain regime, where actually this so picture of a joint spectral mode sort of stops being uh, being uh, very accurate. So um, nonetheless, it's it's very important to measure this uh, structure, and there's like two conventional techniques. Uh, one is to measure your photon pairs using uh, single photon spectrometers. So these are usually done using uh, like single photon cameras and, and gratings, or you can use time of flight spectrometers. Uh, and so you just look for coincidences uh, between measuring the photon at omega-1 and omega-2, and then uh, the, that tells you about the, the joint probability. Uh, so it tells you about the absolute value squared of your joint spectrum mode. And the, another really nice technique is called stimulated emission tomography. So alongside your pump, you, you send a narrow band uh, seed field, usually from a continuous wave laser. And uh, what this does is it stimulates the, the nonlinear process. So um, 
and in like this this beam here that's generated in green mode instead of being just spontaneously generated photons, it's actually a fairly bright, uh, coherent state. And crucially, the spectral mode of that uh, field is given by a cross section of the joint spectral mode at the, the seed frequency, so at omega naught. So what you can do is scan that seed and measure each one of these slices using a, a regular uh, optical spectrum analysis. Uh, but again, this, this technique only tells you about the, the absolute value squared. It doesn't tell you about the, the phase emission of photon pairs. Uh, but we can use uh, our intensity geometry technique to get that phase information. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, we can send the, the either photon directly to a spectrally resolving detector. Let's imagine that that detects uh, frequency omega h. Okay, so this now heralds in the signal mode a photon that lives in this spectral mode psi omega, which is given by a cross section of the joint spectral mode at that parallel frequency. And then, then we can determine that cross section using the technique I've already mentioned. So we combine it with the coherent state and then do this intensity correlation measurement. This will give us both the amplitude and the phase of the psi omega. Then we just repeat this for all the different herald frequencies that, that we uh, can get. So each slice, but well, each time we get a different herald frequency, we're measuring one slice of this, and we can just stack up the different slices and we get both the amplitude and the phase of the, the joint spectrum. So uh, here was the setup that we built to, um, to test this idea. Here we had a pulse telecom laser. Uh, we split the pulses into two paths. In the bottom path, we just filtered the, the laser down to the single photon level, coupled it into single mode fiber. So this is the reference. In the top path, we, we pumped a potassium titanyl phosphate waveguide. And this is our, our source of uh, photon pairs. So this is a type two spontaneous parametric gap conversion source. Uh, the photon pairs are, are split at this polarizing beam splitter. Uh, the, the idler photon is sent directly to uh, this uh, single photon detector, which I'll say a little bit more about in a second. And the signal is combined with the reference on the on this beam splitter, and then we measure both output ports. So the way that we achieved uh, spectral resolution in this experiment was to use time of flight spectrometry. So the idea is that you send your, your lights, your, your photons, uh, through a very long fiber, which has some dispersion. And because of this dispersion, the different frequency components of your, your light pulses arrive at different times at your detectors. So as long as your um, detector is fast enough and you have a sufficient amount of dispersion, you can make this mapping from frequency uh, to, to time. Uh, so in our case, we used uh, superconducting nanowire <laughs> detectors that have a very fast uh, time resolution, which meant that we had a pretty good uh, spectral resolution. So here are some results. Uh, this is a result for a particular herald outcome. So we measured a particular omega h. Uh, and this is a histogram of measuring omega 1 and omega 2 at the output of this beam splitter. Um, what we see is this regular fringe period again. And this is because we've introduced delay uh, between the, the reference and this heralded single photon. <laughs> so the same trick that we did in the, the previous experiment. Uh, so if we, if we take the Fourier transform, we see three blobs. The sideband here is separated by this 10 picoseconds, and we can filter it by multiple window function, and so on. What we get out of this is the spectrum and the spectral phase of the, uh, of the single photon. And we just repeat this process for all of the different herald outcomes and stack up the data. And this is what we get. So this is the joint spectral mode. And this is the phase. And this is the uh, amplitude. Uh, so the amplitude has this sort of rectangular uh, shape. And this is because we had some bandpass filters in the, in the down converted modes, which kind of caused these sharp cutoffs. And the phase in this, in this first measurement was, was fairly flat, and, and this is what we expected. Okay, and so once you have both the phase and the amplitude, 
for, for the experts in the audience, you can do this uh, Schmidt decomposition of the JSA and uh, you get the Schmidt number, which is close to, to one, which so indicates that the downconverted modes are uncorrelated with frequency and it agrees with the second order autocorrelation measure. So we wanted to do this measurement with um, something that was uh, not a flat base. And, and so one way you can do that is to chirp your pump pulse. And the chirp on your pump pulse then gets mapped onto a chirp on the photons. And in particular, it's mapped in the following way. So there's this kind of correlated phase between the, the generated photons. And we can see this correlated phase show up in our measurement. Um, and uh, like we did a spider measurement on the pump and it, it agrees with, with, the, with what we'd expect. Um, and again, we can, well, one thing I wanna point out here is that the amplitude looks more or less the same as before. It's slightly different because there was a bit of uh, unwanted nonlinearity in, in the first fiber, uh, but it's mostly the same. And so you can trick yourself. If you only measure the joint spectral intensity, you might say, oh, my photon pairs are uh, uncorrelated, but actually the correlations were hidden uh, in, in the phase. Right, and so that actually brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, just to summarize the, the take home message here is that intensity interference, so measuring correlations and in intensity, is a very useful technique um, in interferometry, and it lets you measure the mode structure of your light beams. Uh, in a way that you don't have to worry about phase stability, uh, which I think is uh, very useful. And we use this to measure the joint spectral mode of uh, photon pairs and also the spatial mode of single photons. The references are shown there if you're interested. Um, and in the future, I think some interesting research directions to, directions to push this further is to look at light sources that have a more complicated structure, uh, in particular, like I mentioned at the start of the talk, you have correlations between, between different degrees of freedom. And uh, actually a good source of that is um, the cone of light which is generated uh, when you pump these bulk uh, crystals to do a spontaneous parametric down conversion. This cone naturally has these correlations between the position and the frequency uh, of the photons. Uh, oh, and also, I, I do think it's interesting to go beyond just intensity correlations. So look at the higher order ones. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues, both at the NRC in Ottawa and uh, at Imperial College, and thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Guillaume, for the great talk. I've heard any questions for Guillaume. I do have one. So, the source that you use, um, <coughs> where are the cycles? <coughs> Why there are no, is that part of the filtering? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, so there's no side lobes here because we have band pass filters uh, to filter out. And, and second, for so if you have to work hard to print uh, a non trivial phase with the joint spectral amplitude, which means I guess typically you don't, you, you do have a trivial phase most of the time. Yeah, uh, so it, kind of. Um, once you start pumping your, your down conversion source or your four wave mixing source with strong pulses, it becomes easier for there to be a non trivial phase in your pump. Um, yeah, I know mean, you can sometimes characterize that, or most of the time, you can characterize that by using techniques that are well established for measuring classical pulses. Um, so that's one way of doing it. There can also be phase imparted on your photons after they're generated, which you don't know about. That's another reason why this one. But the second one wouldn't change the purity, right? No, no that's right. Oh, yeah. So the question is, would you expect any advantage from a true single photon reference beam versus a weak coherent state? That's a great question. Uh, yes. So, so the advantage would be, unfortunately, uh, the advantage would be in the, the visibility of the interference pattern. So um, 
when you use a weak coherent state and you combine that with a single photon, in principle, your Angu-Mandel dip, if you want to call it that, uh, can reach unit visibility, but you have to make sure your coherent state is very weak. So as you increase the strength of your coherent state, um, the visibility of the, the dip reduces. Uh, and so this kind of reduces the uh, sort of phase sensitivity of your, your measurement, if you will, because it means that your fringes won't be as sharp. So the advantage is that you, you get a better contrast for your interference fringe uh, if you use a reference that has stuff with Sony statistics, I guess. Uh, uh, thank you for the, the talk. I, I have a very simple minded question. I apologize for that question. It's just, uh, you know, I'm used that uh, there is a, an uncertain rela uh, uncertainty relation between number and phase. And here you seem to be looking at single photons that have a phase, and that I don't understand. Yeah. Can you explain this simple thing to me, please? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, in my, my mind, it's not so simple. I, I kind of think about this a lot. So the phase that we're measuring is a phase that lives in the mode structure of the light. Uh, so it's like a phase, say, between different frequency components of the photon. It's not a phase between, like, that the photon itself carries, if you will. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the best I can answer that. It's, 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 a, it's, a, good, it's a good question. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's, it's, I guess a, another way to view your, your, your question is like, you're, you're saying that the single photons have this, uh, uh, rotationally symmetric uh, Wigner function. So, it, um, I give. How can you see uh, phase sensitive information if it has a symmetry? Well, it's it's yeah. It really comes back to what I, I said. It's like the phase lives in the in the mode structure, not not in this uh, quadrature space. Okay. Thank you. So just to play devil's advocate uh, a little bit. So in the first part where you're measuring the essentially you know, spatial coherence. So I would say this is just measuring the, the spatial mode. Do yeah. you really need quantum light for that and waiting for hours? Or can't you just use, can't you just populate that mode with classical light, do a simple G1 you know, linear interference measurement and get to the information much faster? In our experiment, like with the, the down conversion source, yeah, yes. Uh, where this was like a proof of principle demonstration of the technique. You had in mind, uh, like using this to measure the spatial mode of quantum dots, say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yes. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering how this would help with um, doing holography for self-luminous objects, because you have absolutely no control over the photon emission from the target object in that setting. That's right. Uh, so the game would be to uh, kind of configure your reference to match the, the target. Um, so in the case of the quantum dot, uh, they had to, I mean, the, the sunlight is a bad reference, but they, they were able to see this interference by filtering the sunlight so that its spectrum matched that of their quantum dot. Um, you can imagine playing this sort of game with a laser. Hey, there are no further questions. Let's thank Ian for the great talk.